Throughout the New Testament, we're given many pictures of the church's relationship to Jesus Christ. He's called the vine, we are called the branches. He's the bridegroom, we are the bride. He's the shepherd, we are the sheep. These are just a few of the more popular ones. There is, however, an analogy of the church and Jesus that we seldom hear about. It's the picture of Christ as the chief cornerstone and the church as the temple of God. You see, God is building a temple today. It has no human architect or builder, and he's not accomplishing constructing it from concrete or steel, marble or gold. It's a temple patterned after the tabernacle in the wilderness made with living stones. On this edition of the Sunday Sermon Broadcast, we'll hear our Bible teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, give us a survey of Christ as the cornerstone and then explain how the church relates to that cornerstone. The sermons from the second chapter of Ephesians, starting in verse 19, and Dr. McGee called it, This is the house that God built. Dr. McGee served as the pastor of the Church of the Open Door in downtown Los Angeles for 21 years, and it was during that time that he gave this sermon. Now, before we get to it, though, let's hear from some listeners to our foreign language broadcasts. This first letter comes to us from Algeria, where our Kabyle broadcast reaches the Berber people of the Atlas Mountain region. The listener writes, It gives me great joy to be able to write you this letter, thanking everyone on the radio team for your program. As you know, our country is spiritually dead. Even I had always said that there is no hope for this country. However, lately I have come to understand that God's Spirit is blowing throughout the land and touching our hearts. I'm convinced that salvation is coming to Algeria. It's my prayer that Algeria will be saved. I pray that many Christian workers will come and help in the fields of Algeria. With each one of us working together under the leadership of God, Satan and his evil ways will be defeated. I want to also mention the wonderful work that is taking place in the church. The leaders are relentless in their walk with Jesus, and they are doing a wonderful work. I pray that God will continue to bless and protect them. Will you pray for the people of Algeria that the Spirit of God will continue to open the eyes of the blind, that they may come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? Our next letter comes to us from a listener in Africa who hears our English language broadcast, and he writes, I wish to express my appreciation and gratitude to God and to yourselves for the continued broadcast of your program through the Bible. The program is of great help and very important to both Christians and non-Christians and can lead people to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. To Christians such as me, it builds us up and strengthens us in our faith and in our love to God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. In the program of the late Dr. J. Vernon McGee, he teaches many biblical principles which should be applied in life on earth for the well-being of all mankind, such as the death penalty. I would like to thank God for the guidance that he gave to the late Dr. McGee in establishing a radio broadcast service for the preaching of the gospel and the teaching of the true word of God. I wish to assure you that I listen to the broadcast of your Through the Bible program, and I will continue to do so as long as I live. The Farsi, or Persian language program, can be heard predominantly in the country of Iran, as well as many of the surrounding areas. Next, we have letters from two listeners who hear our Farsi broadcast and are greatly blessed by the program. The first listener writes, I have to congratulate you for inviting people to turn back to the only Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. Every day I feel like I am, figuratively speaking, caught in the paws of a wolf which is trying to eat me. Thank you on behalf of myself and my family that you are showing us how to live according to the teaching of Jesus Christ. After listening to your program for some time, I recognized that even though I believed in God, I was not a believer. I am 18 years old and born into a traditional Christian family. We knew about Jesus from our grandparents and what they told us. We did not have a Bible and never went to church. When I came across your radio program, it was an answer to my prayer to learn more about Jesus. Thank you for becoming the river of life for us. And our second letter from a Farsi listener reads, When I was 17 years old, I was sent to jail because I had in my possession literature that was against the government. I spent many years there. I saw and experienced how prisoners were tortured in the name of God. After I was released from jail, I searched for the truth and for peace for my soul. 
I had lost all hope. Then I came across through the Bible radio program that talked about hope, love, and kindness. Slowly, my pain went away and was replaced by a seed of hope in my heart. I am alive in Christ. My faith started because of your program. When my family and I escaped to another country, I had some of your programs recorded, and along with the literature, we were comforted during our time of transition. I continue to follow Jesus, and I pray you will continue to spread the gospel to many other peoples. How wonderful to know that the Word of God is having an impact all over the world. Now let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, bless your word as it goes out today. May it penetrate into the depths of the hearts of all who hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. Our subject this evening is, This is the house that God built. This is the house that God built. And tonight, I want to turn to the second chapter of the Epistle to the Ephesians. Man is essentially a builder. He is like his creator in the sense that he likes to build. He likes to create. All the way from Noah's Ark to the Queen Mary, man has dared to build a city on water and to make it float. From the Tower of Babel to the Empire State Building, man has attempted to build higher and higher and bigger and better. From the wall of China to the wall of radar that crosses the Arctic Circle, man has built for protection. All the way from the palaces of the Assyrian monarchs to a bungalow in a housing track in Southern California, man has built for comfort. All the way from the temple of Diana of the Ephesians to the temple of Moroni of the Mormons on Santa Monica Boulevard, man has been a builder. May I say to you that men are still building, and if you'll listen, you'll hear the, the sound of a hammer and saw all the way from a chicken coop to a skyscraper. Man today is a builder. May I say to you that God is a builder. He is the architect of this universe in which you and I live. God is a marvelous architect. But the greatest work that God has ever done is the work that he's doing today. It's his creation. He's building a temple, and that temple is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It is the church, and the church today is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Paul says in this chapter, we are his workmanship. The word for workmanship is poema. It, uh, well, actually, we get our word by transliteration, poem. We are his poem. We are his poem. The church today is a poem. It's a dream, if you please, as far as a building is concerned. It's going to be on display throughout the eternal ages. God says that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. This is a temple that will be on display throughout the eternal ages. It will be the most beautiful thing that has ever been created. We are his poem, created in Christ Jesus under good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. You see, the church is God's building, and each one that God saves is put as a living stone in this building. It's all God's work. It's all of his grace. He happens to be the architect. He happens to be the contractor. He ha happens to be the one that will occupy the building. It's all his work. But he's very careful to say, that we are his workmanship, we are created in Christ Jesus, something new and different that's never been seen, but in order that we might perform good works. For that is the way that the church will demonstrate in the world today, that it belongs to Jesus Christ is by good works. Now will you look at this building with me tonight for just a few moments, this temple that God is building? 
And back of this temple that God is building today, there are two temples that cast a shadow. And they are in the thinking of the Apostle Paul, you may be sure of that. One is a heathen pagan temple. That p pagan heathen temple was the temple of Diana, yonder in Ephesus, the ones to whom Paul addressed this letter. Paul knew something about that. Paul was almost mobbed when he was in the city of Ephesus, almost stoned to death, and the reason was because of that pagan heathen temple. It itself was a dream. It was one of the wonders, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was the largest Greek temple that had ever been built. And my friend, the world has never equaled Greek architecture, not today. May I say to you that every building that is being put up in Los Angeles owes something to Greek architecture. That temple yonder in Ephesus was the finest, the largest that had ever been built. It was a base thing as far as morals were concerned, but it was an art gallery, one of the most beautiful things that's ever been constructed, but in it was the most hideous idol that the world presented. It was a crude thing. It was the, not the Greek Diana of the hunt or of the moon, but it was the Diana of the Orient, the many-breasted, the goddess of fertility. And there she was with a trident in one hand and a club in the other hand. A crude image, and about that temple was all sorts of immorality. May I say to you, that temple is in the background. There was another temple that was in the background. That was the temple yonder in Jerusalem, God's temple, at this time called Herod's temple, if you please. And already the Lord Jesus had said to them, Ichabod is written across its threshold. Your house is left under you desolate. The Shekinah glory was no longer there, but it was in substance the temple of God upon this earth. With that as the background, now Paul says, I want to tell you about another temple, a new temple, the temple that God is building today. And there are three things that always enter into any building, and it seems to me that these three are essential. The first is the material out of which it is being built. That is essential. This is a concrete building that we are in. It's made out of concrete. Uh, there is a building up the street made out of marble. There is a brick down the street made out of a brick. And the material actually identifies the building, whether it's brick or marble or concrete or stucco or whatever it might be. The material is important. The second thing is the method of construction. We call it the blueprint. And the third is the meaning of the building. What use is to be made of it? Paul discusses all three here. Now, when we put up a building today, we need good material. In fact, the matter is you want the very best material. Yeah, that is something that is very essential today. You will recall that immediately after the war, I think one of the first housing tracts that went in Southern California went in up in the area where the church I had in Pasadena was. It gave us the advantage, I think, the first advantage of any church in Southern California. We were the first church to see an explosion in membership, double in about two years. And it was due to the fact that they put up the first housing tract. And I used to go over there practically once a week and wander around through the housing tract looking at it. And I got acquainted with the man who was the contractor. And he said to me one day, it's a disgrace, uh, these uh, places that I'm putting up here. He says, I'm ashamed of them. And I said, why? Well, he says, it's the material. He said, the only thing you can get now is green lumber. And he says, the houses that we built at first, they are already beginning to warp. Why, he says, I can take you over there and show you one that we put up, and a cat can run under the kitchen door already because it's made out of the wrong kind of material. And he said this to me. He says, I do not care what contractor you have and how good he is. He can't put up a good house without good material. 
And I was very happy to be able to inform him that I knew an architect that could take bad material and put up the loveliest temple that anyone has ever seen. God is using bad material. And he's building the temple today, the loveliest thing. It'll be a gem throughout the endless ages of eternity. And he's taking the worst material that you could possibly get. You want to look at the material for just a moment? And it's very personal. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now, he's taking dead material. The interesting thing is that he's taking dead material and he's making a, quite an amazing temple. We'll find out it's a living thing. Men today take living wood and they make it dead and they have to have it dead before they can put it up into a building. God works the opposite direction. And God is taking dead material and putting it into a live, growing building. Now, dead material is not very good material. It's rotten, we're told here. It's corrupt. It's the kind of material that you actually would throw aside. God's not throwing it aside. God is taking today dead material. May I say to you tonight that every person that God saves is a person who is spiritually dead. And I do not want to be ugly tonight, but if you have come in here or if you are listening in tonight, and you have not yet, by faith, come to Christ and accepted him because you've seen yourself a dead in trespasses and sins and a lost sinner, then I want to say this to you tonight. You are dead spiritually. You are absolutely dead to God and the things of God. And as a result, actually, you can't hear the voice of God. It will only be as the Spirit of God moves in and quickens you. And that's the thing that Paul says, You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. And if tonight you've been saved, it was you were saved out of a dead state. You see, you and I are born in the world dead. That's an interesting thing. But we are not, we say the little fellow is born alive. He's not born alive, he's born dead. I mean spiritually dead. Dead to God, dead to the things of God, not in touch with God at all. Why is it that a little fellow, you never have to teach him to lie. You never have to teach him to steal. You never have to teach him to be bad. But you do have to teach them to be the, and do the right thing. Why is that? Now, and I know your child is different, but wasn't that way with my child. May I say to you, 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 you have to teach them the things that are right because they're wrong, and they're wrong because they're wrong fundamentally with Almighty God, dead to God and dead to the things of God. It happened back in the Garden of Eden. When man sinned in the Garden of Eden, man died. He died to God. God had said to him, In the day that ye eat thereof, ye shall surely die. Now, if you read the record, actually, Adam did not die physically for almost a millennium. It was almost a thousand years before he died. But God said, In the day that ye eat thereof, ye shall surely die. And Adam died the day he ate. How did he die? He died spiritually. He no longer had any capacity for God. He was out of fellowship with God. And when God came into the garden in the cool of the day, this man before had run to meet and worship God. Now he runs away from him. And from that day to this, man has been running away from God as fast as he possibly can. And so that day, Adam died spiritually. Adam was created in the image of God, but he begat a son in his own image, dead to God, dead spiritually. And when you and I come into the world, we don't come into the world with a capacity for God. We don't come into the world with a little, nice little germ of light down here and a desire for God, but we come into this world an enemy of God. And God moves into the scene. You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. 
And tonight, may I say, there are two classes of people here, those that are alive to God and those that are dead to God. And if you are dead to God, you have no capacity for him whatsoever, nor do you have any capacity for the things of God. It's only as the Spirit of God quickens us, regenerates us, and that's what it means to be born again, is to have the Spirit of God regenerate those who are spiritually dead. And tonight, if you hear his voice, he says, If any man hear my voice, any man will hear my voice. Well, I'm confident there in the crowd there that day that Simon Peter probably nudged him. He said, Well, they all hear you. You're talking loud. But that's not what he meant. If any man hear my voice, the dead don't hear. And honestly, to preach the gospel today, uh, a preacher needs to recognize two things. He needs to recognize that he's helpless and hopeless. I'm helpless tonight. I just well go out to Forest Lawn and stand up there and say, Ladies and gentlemen, I have a message for you. And if I did that tonight, I want to tell you I'd be led away and put in an institution. They'd say, That preacher is talking to dead people. But I'm talking to dead people tonight, my friend here in this auditorium and listening in tonight. You're dead to God and dead to the things of God, and you do know that much. You have no capacity for God, no love for him, no desire for the things of God, no desire to live for God. You have no response at all to the things of God, and multitudes are like that. May I say to you tonight that I'm absolutely helpless because I'm talking to dead people. Oh, there's some spiritually alive, I know that. But when I'm talking to the lost, I'm talking to a dead man, and I'm hopeless and I'm helpless. But I want to add something to that. May I say to you that the Holy Spirit of God is here, and the Holy Spirit of God can do something that no man can do. He can open dead ears. He can cause a dead mind to hear and comprehend and understand that Christ died for him. And may I say to you, when a man sees that and will turn to Christ, I want to say to you that he is absolutely born again, made a child of God. I remember that when I was pastor in Nashville, Tennessee, there was a, one of the most beautiful young ladies I think that I've ever seen. She was about 14 years of age that attended our Sunday school. She had one of the most godless fathers that I've ever seen. He would only come to church with her twice a year. That was at Christmas and Easter. And uh, the man was very resentful. One of the first year he came, I just went up and shook his hand and, and uh, told him how glad we were to see him. And she told me afterwards, she said, you know, that he felt that, uh, that uh, you're just putting on. And he doesn't like that. And, uh, well, I said, I'll be careful next time he comes. So the next time he came, I just barely shook his hand. He said, then, he says, I don't like that place because they are not very cordial. You couldn't please that brother, I can assure you that. No way in the world of pleasing him at all. And he would come. I suppose that three years went by. And one night he called me and he said, could I come over? And I said, yes. And I wondered what was the matter, because the man barely spoke to me. He, when I went to the door and looked at his face, I knew that he was under great stress of some sort. It's a story, it's a long story, which I'll not tell, but that man, through a series of events that uh, happened to him, he was brought to the face-to-face -face with whether he should do something relative to his relationship to Jesus Christ. I very seldom have this happen in my ministry. He said, would you explain to me how a sinner can get saved? And I said, I sure will. And I used to use a, just a piece of brown wrapping paper and use colored chalk. And he and I got down on the floor in the living room of the manse, down on our hands and knees, and I went down that chart. I showed him that man started out in the Garden of Eden was a sinner. He had a sinful nature, and I wanted to rub it in on him. I said, the reason that you've been coming to church and it means nothing to you is you're dead. 
You had just been just like a corpse coming in. You couldn't hear. And he said, that's exactly right. It meant nothing to me. And I came on down to the cross, and I showed him that Jesus Christ died for him on the cross. And do you know that I went over that, I'm confident, a dozen times that night. I went over it so many times, I felt the words would stick in my mouth if I went over them again. The man kept saying, go over that again, I don't quite get it. And finally, all of a sudden, the man says, I see it. Why have not I seen this before? May I say up to that moment we'd been talking to a dead man that was under conviction of sin, but then the Spirit of God opened his mind and a heart. Ye hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. That's the material that God's using today. That's the material out of which he's building the church today. Not only is it dead, it's warped. Will you notice? Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world. Twisted and distorted, if you please. You can't put up much of a building with that kind of material. But God is, because God has moved into this scene. And those that one time walked according to the course of this world, doing the things that please themselves. But God, who's rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. And now by grace we are saved. And God moved in. My beloved, when you start out with a dead man, that dead man hasn't very much to boast of. And the reason that throughout the eternal ages we'll be for the praise of his grace is because every person that's going to be saved and will be in the church throughout the endless ages of eternity will be able to say, I'm here because of his grace. I did not do anything. I did not merit anything. I have nothing that you can praise me for. You can't pat me on the back and say to me that I did something. I did nothing. It was his grace that reached down. And when I was dead in trespasses and sins and I heard the gospel, it meant nothing to me, and finally the Spirit of God quickened me and made me a new creation in Christ Jesus. And I'm here because Jesus Christ loved me and died for me, and he actually raised me from the dead that I might hear and I might believe. My friend, tonight, if you've never rejoiced in the fact that God saved you, you ought to because he actually had to raise you from the dead in order for you to hear, in order for you to be redeemed. He had to absolutely bring you from the scene of spiritual death into that of spiritual life. This is the material that God is taking. Now will you notice the kind of a building that he's putting up today? And I would call your attention to that temple that he gave, first of all, instructions to Moses to make a tabernacle. A tabernacle, he said, that's like one in heaven. Moses made that tabernacle in the wilderness after that pattern. But the interesting thing about that was that it was known for its petitions. It had many petitions. And it was always horizontal to the ground. They had to apparently get a level place out on the desert every time it was put up. It was divided into actually three compartments. Around it was a fence made of linen, ten cubits high, a hundred cubits on a side and fifty cubits in width. Inside that court were two articles of furniture made of brass, a brazen altar on which every offering in Israel was offered, and then a laver that was for the washing of the hands and a base where the feet were washed. And then on the inside, for it was then made up of 30 by 10 cubits, and that again was divided by a veil, so that there was in the first compartment, which was really the second compartment, the holy place, there were three articles of furniture. There was the golden lampstand on the left as you entered, the table of showbread on the right, and then the golden altar 
that stood immediately before the veil where incense was offered. Then back of that veil where the high priest only went once a year, there were two articles of furniture, a mercy seat and an ark. A sinner is when he came to God, it was pretty complicated. It wasn't easy. When he came, he brought a little sacrifice. And as he looked, there were three entrances, but he couldn't get through them. They're blocked. There is the, the gate, and there's the door and the veil. And he could not get past except the first. He had to have a sacrifice, and he came to the altar, and he offered that little sacrifice, whatever it was for his sin. A priest went on for him inside the veil, and only once a year did he go there. And this was all, may I say, a pretty complicated sort of thing. May I say to you that when the Lord Jesus died on the cross, he turned that tabernacle upside down. It's no longer horizontal to the earth. This building now is perpendicular to the earth. The brazen altar is still on the earth. That's the cross. Nineteen hundred years ago, he died in a historical time and in a geographical place. Nineteen hundred years ago, there was that altar, and men and women today that look back there in faith are saved. But you don't go on into a holy place in a holy place. He's gone back into the heavens. And tonight this temple has made every person that has come to Christ a priest. And instead of going horizontal, we go perpendicular and we go directly. In fact, we're invited to come with boldness to his throne of grace. And we are to bring in yonder our petitions. And when we have need and we want mercy, we find it up yonder where he's gone at God's right hand, our great high priest, and he's there tonight for us. May I say that this temple's a little different than any that's ever been built. It's perpendicular, not horizontal with the earth. And then there's something else about it. The temple was made up of all sorts of petitions. I've called attention to these three entrances, but when the temple was built yonder in Jerusalem by Solomon, then Zerubbabel's temple, and then the temple that was then in existence, which was the temple of Herod, it, it again was complicated as to petitions. If you had gone there, my friend, tonight as a Gentile, you wouldn't have gotten very, very close. You'd have been way back. Because, you see, first of all, there was the place where the active priests came. Those that were in service, they were in the holy place. Nobody but the high priest ever went into the holy of holies. You were kept out of that. Into the holy place the active priests went. Out yonder in the outer one, all of them could come, the whole tribe of Levi. They had a place on the right that was called the priest's court. Only priests could go in there. Out immediately in front was the place for the nation Israel. Farther out to the left was the women's court. And way out yonder was the Gentiles' court. What happened when Jesus died? And he began now building a new temple. What happened? May I say to you, this is what happened. Listen to this. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's Gentiles. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood. No longer does the Gentile have to go into a court way out yonder. No longer does the women have to go to a court over here. No longer do the priests go here. No longer does Israel go here. But today, listen to this. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. When the Lord Jesus came down and died upon the cross, he swept out all of the partition. And this is a building 
that doesn't have a petition in it today. That's the church. And there's no distinction today but among believers at all. We stand on the same level. There's no such thing as dividing believers today up in any two classes. They all stand in one class. Every petition is taken out. They have a building in Dallas, Texas, 40 stories high. And the marvel about that building is that in the first floor there is a bank, and there is not a pillar in that bank. I don't know how they did it, but there's 40 stories up above there, but not a pillar on the inside. We can't even have a basketball team up on top of this church here because they won't let us. They say there's not enough uh, support. But there's 40 stories in Dallas, and there's not a pillar. It's lots larger than even this auditorium. But as I've looked at that thing, a friend took me around through it, and uh, I said to him, I said, you know, the church today is the temple, and in this temple that he's building today, there's not a petition in it or a pillar. <laughs> oh, I know some of the churches, some of us have sleeping pillars, but I mean we don't have any other kind. There's no pillars today in the church at all. May I say to you that all petitions are taken out and all have been made one in Christ. The Gentile is no longer far off. The priest has no longer peculiar privileges. All have been made a priesthood of believers stand on equal ground before Almighty God. That's not the only thing that's marvelous about this building. We are told that we are built upon the foundation of the apostles. Don't misunderstand that. The apostles are not the foundation. This, uh, brethren, is an objective genitive. I have to keep these fellows right up on their Greek today. I found out they're neglecting their Greek. This is an objective genitive, which means simply this, that it's the foundation which the apostles laid. They are not the, they are not the foundation, but the apostles, they put down a foundation. And you know what that is? Even on the day of Pentecost, we are told that when that great company were saved, that they continued in the apostles' doctrine. Apostles' doctrine. That's the foundation on which the church is built today. And may I say to you tonight that when the church gets away from the apostles' doctrine, it's no longer a church. It's a house built on shifting sands. The only foundation is that which the apostles have laid, and there is actually only one cornerstone, we are told here, and are built upon the foundations with the, which the apostles laid and prophets, Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus himself, being the chief cornerstone. And he is the cornerstone. No other foundation can any man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He's the only one. And tonight, this temple that God is building, he's taking believers, and he's taking these believers, and he's fitting them into this building, putting them on Christ. And if tonight you're in the church, I'm talking now about the church of the living God. It's not a building like this, but it's living believers, and they are put into this building, and they're put on a foundation, and that foundation is Jesus Christ. You know tonight whether you really belong to the church tonight. It means that you were once dead, you're now alive. It means that you're resting upon Jesus Christ, and you're resting upon the doctrine of the apostles. Now, what's the meaning of the building? And let me just say a word and close. Paul tells us here, he tells us that in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. What a contrast to the temple of Diana in Ephesus. It was an immoral place, but this church is to be a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. 
You're a habitation of God through the Spirit. Will you listen now very briefly in closing? This is all important. God has never occupied a building down here on this earth. That's paganism. You won't find that in the Word of God. When Solomon dedicated the temple yonder in Jerusalem, he said this, The heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, and how can this house that we built? He knew that God did not dwell in a house made with hands. He never has. But today the Holy Spirit indwells believers. Every one that was dead in trespasses and sins, walking contrary to God, now come to the Lord Jesus Christ. You are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, not only regenerated by the Holy Spirit. And tonight it can be said that God's in his holy temple. He's indwelling every believer. And tonight he's in this place, the Holy Spirit indwelling believers here. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Now, I know some folks say, well, that's for the millennium. Sure it is. I know that too. But may I say to you, he's in his holy temple today. He's indwelling believers. Why don't people know it? I'll tell you why. Paul a little later says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. Tonight, every believer here, you are either living with a grieved or ungrieved Holy Spirit. Either you grieved him, and nobody can tell whether you're a child of God or not, or else you have an ungrieved Holy Spirit tonight. And the Spirit of God can move through you. And the Spirit of God can use you. O oh, child of God tonight, is the Spirit of God moving through your heart and moving through your life? If you are his child, if you've been quickened, if you've been redeemed, the Holy Spirit of God is indwelling you. Why doesn't he manifest himself through you? Only one explanation. You grieved him, and when you grieve him, oh, you're sealed. He won't leave you. <laughs> Even when you grieve him, you're sealed unto the day of redemption. But when you've grieved him, you're as powerless as Samson. And that's the condition tonight of the church. That's the reason Los Angeles is not impressed by the church of the open door. They are not sure that we are indwelt by the Spirit of God. May God help us in this hour in which we are living. Are you part of the church today? I'm not asking if you're a member of a local church in your area. I'm asking if you've experienced the grace and mercy of God by receiving Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you have, then you're a living stone in the growing temple of God placed upon the unshakable foundation of Jesus Christ. If not, then we'd like to send you some helpful information about God's plan of salvation for your life. All you need to do is call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE anytime and request our salvation packet. And when you do call, be sure to leave a voicemail and include your name, address, and the call letters of this station. Now, today's sermon was, This is the House That God Built. And it's available on individual CD if you're interested in obtaining a copy for yourself, a friend, or a family member. For ordering information, just call one of our helpful service operators. They can be reached live Monday through Thursday from 6 a.m. to 3 p.m. Pacific Time. Or shop online at ttb.org. It's been said that the crown of Scripture is the book of Ephesians, which is where you'll find Dr. McGee this week on the Through the Bible radio program heard on this station. If you'd like to study along with us on a regular basis, then you'll want to be added to our mailing list for notes and outlines and our monthly newsletter. To do that, just call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE, use our Internet order form, or download them from our website at ttb.org, or write to Sunday Sermon. For those in the U.S., Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325. London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. And we pray that God will fill you with his grace, mercy, and peace every moment of every day. Sin had left a crimson 
This program has been brought to you by the faithful friends and supporters of Through the Bible Radio Network.